And welcome to another edition of DT Live. I hope everyone's doing well this evening. Tonight's stream is going to be a little bit shorter than a typical stream of mine. I'll probably only go about an hour this evening. I really wasn't planning on doing much today. Uh, here in the last couple of weeks, I've been working a lot on various config files, dot files, uh, a lot of scripting, a, a lot of the repositories over on my GitLab. I, I've been working on a lot of that stuff. And today, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about what I've been doing. And uh, one of the things is people are often asking me how to install various things. How do I use your config for this or that? Or how do I get this script to work and, and things like that? So we may cover some of those questions. Any of you guys in the chat, if you've struggled getting any of my configs or scripts or anything like that working, uh, if you want to ask a question or something, I will try to answer questions for those that have those types of questions. So just very briefly here. I get to the YouTube chat here and there's several people here already kind of an impromptu stream I didn't give you guys much of a heads up on this stream here this evening I really didn't plan on doing any content uh, today I spent most of the day away from home so uh, getting back to normal after being sick for a few days and then uh, I got back into working a little bit here in the last couple of days but I was kind of week and, and you know couldn't do much as far as physical activity today i felt like really 110 percent went to the gym this morning spent some time out in, in the yard doing some yard work you know a lot of physical activity and you know all of that is, is fine i obviously i have my voice back now so <laughs> there was a issue uh, that live stream i did this past sunday where i could barely talk so you know over all of that thankfully there are those of you that are in the YouTube chat. Give me a yay or a nay on the audio. I'm assuming the audio is fine, though, since nobody has complained yet. So uh, we got a lot of folks here in the chat already. Learn Linux. How you doing? Henry, Melina, and Adeska. Emacs Enthusiast. I love the name. <laughs> so, big pod. How are you doing, sir? Uh, chaos. Mm. All right. Yeah, still waiting on your ZFS videos. Uh, is that for me or is that for somebody else? I don't typically uh, use ZFS, uh, <laughs> so I don't know much about it. Uh, I, I typically stick to Extend 4 on, on all of my machines anyway. I really haven't played much with ZFS because until recently, it wasn't much of an option on Linux. So, uh, Appreciate the super chat there from RoboNuggy. says, yay for the audio. <laughs> all right. You know, yeah. Uh, I won't say you were the only one that said yay. There were a few other yays also, but DT, your mic's muted. I doubt that. It's pretty easy to figure out whether I'm muted or not. When I ask, how's the uh, volume? You know, I'm, is it too loud, too low? When somebody says, hey, you're completely muted, I, I mean, I can, I've got a little meter here where I know I'm speaking in the mic and it's registering. So. All right, guys. Well, today uh, I was just going to show you a little bit what I've been doing here in the last couple of weeks. You guys know I've been really working a lot on Xmonad and Emacs. And, uh, you know, I, I say I'll eventually get some kind of deployment script for my Emacs slash Emacs desktop environment. But uh, and when I say that, I often get people say, hey, DT. I can help you with a deployment script, you know, to place all your dot files, you know, on, on a system. I don't really need help with a deployment script. I mean, uh, I can I can write a deployment script rather easy. And this that's not the deployment script. That's the hard part with something like this is I've got a ton of config config files, a lot of dot files, and uh, you know when I install my xmonad desktop you know we're going to install a number of programs and i want them to be configured properly for a proper cohesive experience and i also want you guys to be able to understand the configs and everything so it's really cleaning up the individual configs themselves that is all the work that's like 99.9 .9 of the work that's not me writing a deployment script that's the hard part that that'll be that'll be the easy part like that's once everything else is done writing the actual script will be fine but uh xmonad these days let me actually uh open up my 
uh, do me max here if i do a search for my xmonad config i spent some time cleaning this up uh, this table of contents you guys that have uh, used some of my older configs this table of contents used to have probably three times as much stuff in it <laughs> this config seriously used to be over a thousand lines long and now we are 635 lines so i, I cut it in half probably the config so it really streamlined it got rid of a lot of the extra modules and things that i don't think most people need I, you know anything that i thought was a fringe case like one out of a hundred people might find a use for it i got rid of that right anything like that i, I wanted to keep the things that i thought most desktop linux users would be like yeah i needed that feature thanks for adding that to your config but you know the really weird stuff i wanted to get rid of so now you know i've still got a lot of modules imported but for the most part uh, we've really streamlined a lot of this and as far as when i say it's my xmonad slash emacs desktop environment Obviously, a lot of my key bindings and everything involve Emacs. So in my Xmonad configs, if you go grab my Xmonad config and you're an Emacs user and you have Emacs installed, uh, Control E followed by another key runs all of my Emacs stuff. So if I do Control E E, there's Emacs, Doom Emacs in, in this case. Control E B runs the iBuffers program, shows you all the buffers that are open. If I do Control E D, that is Deer Ed, the file manager inside Emacs. And if I do Control E N, I believe it's Lfeed. Yes, that's Lfeed, the RSS reader. Uh, Control E S is the eShell. If for some reason you prefer the uh, eShell, it's not. A normal shell, it's a shell written in ELISP, it's kind of Emacs centric, kind of a neat thing to play around with, especially if you're interested in learning ELISP. Uh, if you want a proper terminal emulator inside Emacs, control E V in my config brings up V term, which is a proper terminal emulator. V term is a real terminal emulator and it uses a real shell, whatever shell you set it to. I've set mine to use fish, but it can use uh, bash or zsh whatever it is you want to use so just a normal terminal emulator so uh, that's a lot of what i was trying to do was replace some of the not replace because i'll still have alacrity alacrity will be part of the deployment script if you guys want to just use a standard terminal emulator but if for some reason you want a terminal emulator as an emacs buffer the v term works just fine and why would you want a terminal emulator as an Emacs buffer? Well, why not, right? So when you bring up your Emacs buffer list, you know, you'd have V term here and you could actually easily switch between, I don't know, your text editor and your terminal emulator and things like that. Drinking coffee this evening, guys. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind. Felt like I needed a little caffeine, so I made me a cup of black coffee. Uh, let's see, 8-Bit Oni. Interesting name. Just wanted you to know how happy I am that you are all about content and not politics. Thanks for your channel. Appreciate that. That's another thing. Uh, we're we're going to get into some of my GitLab repos here in a little bit, and uh, we should probably visit the false code of conduct, because that was something I spent some time uh, updating uh, about a week, week and a half ago as well. All right. And you guys are and not much uh, interesting chat here in the, in the chat. The wallpaper. Yeah, that wallpaper is really cool. I can't remember where I got the wallpaper from, but the wallpaper, if you go, well, we might as well get into some of my GitLab stuff. So you guys, my GitLab is gitlab.com slash DWT1. And I have a, a bunch of repositories over on GitLab, but gitlab.com slash DWT1. And if I go into all of my projects here, uh, one of them, of course, will be wallpapers. And that's just my wallpaper collection. And it's like 300 wallpapers in a repository. And I am not sure what number the one we're looking at is. I could probably figure it out, though. What are we using to set our wallpaper? Let me get into my Xmonad config. Let's zoom in. 
And I'm going to page down to the auto start hook here. And what I'm doing to set wallpaper these days is, well, where is it? Ah, right here. It's, uh, I've got two sections of the auto start hook now because now I have these five lines here. Four of them are commented out. So if you want to set a wallpaper, I gave you five different ways to set a wallpaper. One with nitrogen, two of them with Fey, F-E-H, and, you know, Fey, set the last saved wallpaper, or Fey, give us a random wallpaper. And I also did the same thing with X wallpaper. X wallpaper, set the last wallpaper, or X wallpaper, give us a random wallpaper. And I am doing uh, X wallpaper, give me a wallpaper that I saved. And what I'm doing is, I'm with X args, I'm running X wallpaper dash dash stretch to fill the screen. And I'm getting that wallpaper from this file here. It's just a, a, a file I put in my home directory, .x wallpaper. I could have named that file anywhere, anything, put it anywhere. And uh, how was this file created? It's because when I do control, actually not control, super F1, SXIV comes up and I pick a wallpaper and then I do control X S to save. I believe, or is it control X W for wallpaper? I'd have to double check the key binding. It sets the wallpaper and it writes to that file. And that's part of my SXIV config. It writes to that file. And then in my Xmonad config, I'm taking that file that it wrote the location of the wallpaper to, and I'm setting that with X wallpaper. But anyway, long story short is because I know it writes the name of that wallpaper to that file. I mean, we could cat dot x wallpaper, and it is zero two three nine dot jpeg. So if you go back to my uh, GitLab repository, my wallpapers repository on my GitLab, and go grab zero two thirty nine. If you don't want the entire wallpaper pack, you can just go grab that one wallpaper, and there it is. Got off on a sidetrack there. <laughs> Sidetracked pretty easily about the wallpaper. I probably should discuss more about S SXIV. What SXIV is doing. The... Uh, the image program. So SXIV, let me get to a, a different workspace here. So if I do a super F1, you know, I get my wallpaper directory in thumbnail mode here listed in SXIV and I can navigate around and I can pick a wallpaper that I want to set. And once I find one to set, I control X W, I believe, and it sets that wallpaper. I get a notification about it and everything. And the reason that is, is, let me open up my uh, GUI file manager. Somewhere in my .config folder, there should be SXIV. This is where your SXIV config files should, have, uh, should live on the system. You have a folder called exec. These are automatically generated, I believe. I don't think I had to create the exec directory. And key handler. I don't think I had to uh, create this initially either. I think it comes with a default key handler. Uh, I modified this one a little bit. Let me open this up in Emacs here. And what this is, it's basically just a shell script. And it tells SXIV what to do when you mark something, when, when you mark an image, and then run this key binding. Uh, there is a leader key. It's control X. So if I do control X followed by C, I am running this command here, which is not truncated. This line isn't truncated, but it copies the image to of the clipboard to X clip. Uh, control X followed by a D gets me a D menu, I guess, uh, about deleting the file because it's Arium name of file. OK, so and then the one I've been doing control X W sets the wallpaper. It actually uses FEH to set the wallpaper. I have two different ones to set the wallpaper. Control X followed by another X sets the wallpaper with X wallpaper and it writes it to my home directory slash dot X wallpaper. So let's try that. 
So I'm already in SXIV. Let me find a wallpaper to set. I'll just pick a, another random wallpaper and I'm going to do Control X X. And we set the wallpaper that time using X wallpaper. And it wrote the path and the full name of that wallpaper to a file .x wallpaper, which in my xmonad config is in the startup book, right? That's how we always set our last saved wallpaper in xmonad because we spawn once xargs, x wallpaper, name of that file that's saved in x wallpaper. Probably sounds confusing, but it really isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you guys are like, wait, wait, he's doing stuff in Emacs and Xmode now. He's talking about an X SXIV config. <laughs> uh, stuff sounds, it really does. It sounds more complicated than it really is. I, this stuff isn't that hard. If it was hard, I couldn't do it. I'm back to the chat here. It does the wallpaper script work with different wallpapers on different monitors? I mean, I, I, I could make it work that way if I wanted to. Typically, I set the same wallpaper on all the monitors. But yeah, I mean, I could script it however I want to. <laughs> I mean, I could script it. I could have a key binding to set the wallpaper on one monitor. I could have a different key binding to set the wallpaper on another monitor. Probably how, how I'd have to handle that. But it, yeah, it's, it wouldn't be difficult to, to do that. Let's see, uh, Farson says, have you read the book, Texas Hold'em, The Little Haskeller? I found it teaches Haskell better for me than learn you a Haskell for a great good. I have not read that book. I have actually not heard of that book. I am actually going to write that down. Well, actually, I'll just do a copy and paste. And uh, what I'm going to do is I've got a... Uh, a show notes file here somewhere on my system. Give me just a second. Because I think that is interesting, so I definitely want to make sure I write that down. And just a little file I jot stuff down in. But I appreciate the uh, book recommendation there, Farzan. Appreciate that. All right, and I had another super chat. I think I'd miss there. Uh, give me just a second, guys. Uh, yeah, uh, Kosro or Kosral. Not sure if I pronounced your name right. I apologize if that's not correct. He says, I have no words. All right, well, <laughs> uh, appreciate that. I uh, appreciate the super chat, though, and appreciate you hanging out with us uh, this evening. And another $2 super chat. And this time he actually, he did not leave any words at all. Not even I have no words. So. <laughs> uh, Mr. GFY, let's read uh, your chat as well. Try my Reboot 6 script on GitHub if you're going to break stuff. Uh, I'm assuming with that name Reboot 6, it is uh, Russian Roulette. Where <laughs> one time out of six, instead of rebooting the system... Something else happens. Uh, I don't think I'm going to run that script, Mr. GFY. I've seen enough of those scripts floating around. All right. Let's get into some of the other chat here. DT, are you interested in cryptocurrency? I hold some cryptocurrency, but I'm not that interested in the technology and all behind it, no. The only reason I have cryptocurrency is sometimes I get paid in cryptocurrency. Um, obviously, being on Odyssey, I get paid in LBC. So, had I never discovered library and Odyssey, I probably still wouldn't do much with cryptocurrency, to be honest. But these days, now that I have LBC, I often convert it to Bitcoin. Um, so, I've got some Bitcoin, some LBC, got some Dogecoin. I actually got on the Dogecoin uh, train oh, about two months ago. I started thinking, you know what, I, that might be an okay investment. I, I didn't buy a ton of it. I wish I had. <laughs> but I've got uh, a couple of grand worth of Dogecoin lying around somewhere. Not much. Uh, I mean, I, I don't mind speculating a little bit with it, but as far as the technology behind crypto... Yeah, that stuff doesn't fascinate me that much. Maybe one day I'll, I'll change my tune on that and really become a big crypto guy. 
I, I, he pronounced it better than any of my teachers. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm still convinced it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, what, cryptocurrency in general? Uh, probably not. Now that there's real markets for it, uh, it's not going anywhere. To be honest, I think people should just use Monero. It's better and more secure than Bitcoin. I've never heard of Monero. So I don't know anything about Monero. I've heard, you know, I, I know some of the bigger, LBC is not very big because it's library, but I obviously have to deal with that. But I know Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin, you know, I know the ones that um, most people probably deal with. Yeah, use your Threadripper to mine crypto. I don't know if that would be a great idea. Uh, back to the desktop. One other thing uh, with my configs here recently, I spent some time, I cleaned up my Xmo bar. So in Xmonad, uh, a lot of people have been saying they had uh, some issues with my Xmo bar, which I've been using my Xmo bar config, so obviously I didn't have any issues with it. But people were like, yeah, you know, the icons don't line up right, or the icons are cut off, or your, your trayer, uh, it's not really... Uh, sized right it's cutting stuff off so let's see if i can pull up one of my x mobar configs i'm going to pull up uh, the one for the middle monitor because i have three different ones so the, this one here is the one you guys are looking at and this is the config file for it one of the things i changed is before i had uh, the fonts listed i've got four fonts listed and before i only had three fonts listed and the font awesome was font awesome four and which is font awesome no space that is font awesome 4 on arch linux i installed font awesome 5 which is font space awesome 5 you actually have to specify font awesome 5 and then there's a couple of different branches i guess to the font awesome 5 fonts so i did free solid and uh, brands and brands is specifically for the uh, linux the tux icon there as part of the brands uh, fonts. The free fonts are everything else. So that corrected um, a lot of the issues people were having with Font Awesome 4 is sometimes these glyphs weren't spaced quite right. They were cut off, you know, like this monitor. You only got about three quarters of the monitor and then it was cut off. And so now uh, that problem should be fixed. I may go over some of the other stuff in this as well here in a minute. People often ask about Xmo Bar, and people complain that it's it's hard to set up on uh, Xmonad. I think a lot of it is people don't understand with Xmo Bar and Xmonad. Like you don't put Xmo Bar in your Xmonad auto start programs. That's not how you launch Xmo Bar. You know you don't you don't launch Xmo Bar by typing xmobar at a run prompt or in a terminal or anything like that. How you start xmobar is that it actually has to be part of the main block in your xmonad config. So if I go back to my xmonad config and go to the bottom, let's zoom back in here. At the bottom of my config, I have main equals do and then all the main stuff. This is where everything comes together. Oh, yeah, all the rest of the config comes together in main equals do, and then we execute all of this stuff. And one of the things that it does is it launches XMOBAR for you. And the XMOBAR stuff, the relevant stuff is I have three different XMOBAR configs. I'm creating a variable for each of those three configs. I named them XMPROC0. 1 and 2 for monitors 0, 1, and 2, obviously. And of course, they're going to spawn on monitors 0, 1, and 2. So those are the uh, the commands followed by the monitor, followed by the re relevant config file for xmobar. Now, this doesn't actually start them. We're just creating that variable. We have to put those variables down here and log hook equals dynamic log hook with pp. Somewhere in here, you'll have xmobar pp as part of your log hook. Followed by a, an opening bra uh, brace, yeah, closing brace, and then these braces. Everything in between. All these names that start with PP for pretty printing. Get your mind out of the gutter, gutter guys. It's not that kind of PP. So this is all your XMOBAR 
settings like uh, the color of the current workspace or the color of the hidden workspace, things like that. But the very first one I have listed, PP output, is the PP output. Is where is it getting the output? It's getting it from those XM proc 012 variables from up here. I hope that makes sense because I had a lot of people. Well, when I start X Mobar, I just open up a terminal, start X Mobar, nothing happens. I, the bar comes up, but I don't see workspaces or anything like that. That's not the way X Mobar works. It, it has to be started in the uh, the main block of your xmonad.hs, of your xmonad config. I think I missed a super chat there. Let me go back here. Farzan, another uh, super chat from Farzan. He says, have you thought of creating a bootstrapping script for your Linux config? I know Luke Smith has LARBs, for example. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'll, I'll, I'll create some kind of deployment script for, for Xmonad and various things. It'll be a deployment script for Xmonad, for Doom Emacs, a customized version of Doom Emacs, you know, because I, I'm going to have to have it customized to do some of what I do in Xmonad. Out of the box, Doom Emacs, like some of the config stuff. Like if I did Control E W to bring up E W W, the web browser inside Emacs, that doesn't actually work like that in uh, Doom Emacs unless I configure it to do so. By default, in Doom Emacs, E W W, the browser opens in a horizontal split. So trying to open it on its own. It actually opens up a scratch pad and then in a horizontal split, it opens the browser. So, uh, you know, I, I had to change a, a little bit of the way Doom Max does some things. But I do want to use Doom Max rather than GNU Max for my Xmonad uh, desktop. This Doom Max is going to be a, a, a better product. Uh, you know, it would, I, I should probably show you guys when I uh, say this, let me actually open up my doom Emacs config. I won't even bother zooming in, uh, because I'm just going to scroll. I'm going to page down. So this is my doom Emacs config. I got a lot of stuff in it, but you know, 744 lines long, a lot of it's comments. Probably half of this is comments. So really, it's probably about 350, 400 lines long. Now, let me find my GNU uh, Emacs config. And now I'm going to page down. All right. 875 lines long. Again, mostly uh, comments, but... My GNU Emacs config is already longer than my Doom Emacs config, and I don't have even 10% of the extensions installed and, and configured or anything. This config, if, if I configured GNU Emacs to do everything I want it to do, you know, all the stuff in Doom Emacs that I like, this config file seriously is going to be 5,000 lines long. It is going to be a massive config file. And if... This was something I had as part of a, my Xmonad desktop deployment script. People are going to open up this Emacs config, especially if they don't really know much about Emacs, and they're they're just going to be their, their mind is just going to melt. <laughs> so I can't do that. We're going with Doom Emacs because the config is going to be a lot simpler. Package management in Doom Emacs is a thousand times easier than working with GNU Emacs. The other thing is Doom Emacs is just, it's going to be faster than GNU Emacs. Even GNU Emacs as I currently have it with hardly any extensions installed because I haven't got around to adding everything I need, Doom Emacs seriously, with like 200 modules that it loads, you know, as mine is currently configured, it loads in like 0.0, it's like 0 0.4 seconds, you know, half a second it loads. And you only load Emacs the one time, right? A lot of people, well, it took two seconds, three seconds for my GNU Emacs to launch. Well, you launch it one time and it you should never close it. Or you should have the daemon running in the background, which basically means it's open all the time. A lot of people, because I hear people, 
Uh, my Emacs is so slow. I, I can't use Emacs. I have to go back to Vim because Emacs is slow. And I don't under when I, if you're talking slow as in inside the text editor, things move slow, like the cursor is sluggish or, you know, the uh, auto complete stuff. The suggestions slow you down or some of the uh, spell checking, which can really slow things down. I, I get that. But nobody's usually talking about that stuff. They're usually talking about it took two and a half seconds for Emacs to launch when I launched it. It's like, yeah, you only launch it the one time. <laughs> and if you complain about how slow Emacs launches, you really should check out Doom Emacs because they actually do some work to speed things up. They do some magic on the back end where modules don't really load until they have to. So you'll have a config file for GNU Emacs, and then you'll do basically the same stuff in Doom Emacs, and side by side, Doom Emacs will load twice as fast. So that's why these days, even though you know, I, was, I, I spent probably 30 or 40 hours real time configuring GNU Emacs. I spent a solid week, like every waking moment other than you know making my content or going to the gym for a couple hours, I spent basically like a 40 hour work week that week configuring GNU Emacs. And even though I was starting to get it to do exactly what I wanted and I actually liked it, I still think it's better to go, to, go back to Doom Emacs in the end because there are just some things that they do better. All right, back to the chat here. Have you guys got anything good to talk about? Yeah, DT, try other Emacs starter kits. Prelude, Centaur, Space Max. I have, uh, I mean, I've, I've installed Space Max once or twice before. Uh, I haven't done anything on camera with it, but I didn't particularly care for it. And if I know I'm not going to like something, I, I'm not going to put it on video. But you guys want to see me trash a piece of free and open source software? I don't like doing that. <laughs> so... Uh, I, w I probably wouldn't trash Space Max, but, you know, it was slow and bloated. It, it's just, Space Max is very different than Doom Emacs. I, I know I should, probably shouldn't say it's slow and bloated, but it's there's a lot more to Space Max than Doom Emacs. Doom Emacs is actually quite minimal by design. Like, I can pretty much uninstall every module that Doom Emacs comes already you know, pre-installed with rather easily. I just open one file, comment a few lines, and, you know, you can really de-bloat Doom Emacs. And even with everything it ships with by default, it's really not that bloated for a for an Emacs config. My coffee's getting cold. I don't mind having a 5,000 lines long Emacs config as long as it's properly documented. Yeah. The other thing is for me to finish a proper GNU Emacs config to where it does the things I need it to do, especially if I was doing it for, as part of a deployment script, I would seriously have to spend six months just configuring GNU Emacs. You know, it's like, why? Uh, I, I can't justify spending that kind of time on it, on that particular project when I, I've got so many other things I also need to configure. Like, do Emacs just saves us on a lot of the work. Uh, do you miss Vim? No, I actually use Vim all the time, too. I still, you know, oftentimes I'm in a terminal, so I have Alacrity open. You know, I'm doing something in the terminal, and I am I need to edit something quickly in the directory I'm already in. I'm just going to Vim name a file, and, you know, I could launch Emacs to do it, I guess. Or I could use Emacs in the terminal, but typically, I just, if I'm, there's no reason to do Emacs in the terminal for a quick edit either. And let me kill uh, Emacs here. So, in Alacrity, say, you know, I, I needed to do a quick edit to, well, I'm in my home directory. Let's take the bash RC. I have this alias EM. So I could EM space dot bash RC, and that is a alias for Emacs space dash dash NW. Or just a single dash, dash NW. And that means with uh, no GUI. Uh, I'm not sure what the W stands for, no window. 
So it's basically Emacs in the terminal. And it would, it's going to take a second because I don't think it runs off the daemon. It's not like an Emacs client with, you know, the GUI will start up a little faster. But that's Emacs running in the terminal. And it would work. But again, uh, in this case, for a simple edit, why wouldn't I just, just open up Vim, do what I need to do, and uh, it's the same either way here in the terminal. In the GUI, though, Emacs makes sense because Emacs does so much in the GUI. Like from the GUI, you could do anything. Uh, not just related to text editing. I mean, I could... SSH into a machine from here inside Emacs. I could, uh, I could push something to my GitLab with Maggot, the Git client. You know, I could you know stage different things in Git and then push them and play some Tetris. <laughs> you know, whatever I want to do. Uh, let's see. Okay, then I will review those other Emacs distributions on my channel. Go for it. I can't say that I'll never take a look at another Emacs distribution. It's possible. I mean, I took a look at a, a Vim distribution a while back. Uh, Space Mac. No, not Space Mac. Space Vim. Which was interesting. I actually liked that more than I thought I would. It's basically Space Vim. It was an effort to create a... Emacs like Vim. And by an Emacs like Vim, I'm talking about a GUI Vim. It was GVim configured essentially like Space Max. And problem with GVim, even though it's a GUI front end of Vim, it's not a very good GUI. Like that, that's the reason nobody uses a GUI with Vim, is because terminal Vim is actually better than GVim. It doesn't have to be. People could actually work on GVim and make it more than it is, but nobody does. <laughs> GVim's been around you know, forever, you know, since the beginning of Vim, practically. Where Emacs, you know, the GUI is what people use with Emacs. You would use Emacs space dash NW, the terminal version of Emacs, typically not necessarily in a terminal. You would use it in a TTY. You know, that's when you would use the uh, terminal Emacs. It's in a TTY, of course, you don't have any choice. <laughs> but in a TTY, of course, on most Unix-based operating systems, you'd have VI or VM already installed, too. So if you're an evil Emacs user like me, then I, I can always just use VM. Farzan says, have you heard of Emacs-NG? It uses... Dino's JavaScript and async IO environment to bring some modern stuff to Emacs. Mm. It will allow you to write configs packages in JavaScript. Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> uh, so instead of writing everything in Emacs Lisp, which is a real feature for Emacs, I mean, that's why people love Emacs, is because it's Lisp. We're going to do everything in JavaScript. No, <laughs> please tell me that's not, I, I know it's, it's probably a real thing, but I hate that's a real thing, if it's a real thing. Uh, uh, Buster Brown, he says, audio okay, I appreciate that, I, I asked that question, I don't know, 48 minutes ago, 38 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, I, I'm assuming Buster's a little behind on the screen, uh, on the stream. He'll catch up to the rest of us here in a little bit. He probably paused the stream. I do that sometimes with live streams. I'll uh, start listening to a live stream, you know, or something here at the computer, but then I have to get some important work done. I can't have a distraction, so I'll pause somebody's live stream. And I'll have it pause for like a half hour, and then I'll unpause it. But then when you unpause it, don't start posting in the YouTube chat because you look silly <laughs> when you're answering questions that were asked 30, 45 minutes ago. Let's see, JavaScript everything, no, Haskell everything. Actually, Emacs Lisp would be all right, too. Oh, uh, yeah, dang, I miss your beard. <laughs> well, you know me. 
You know, I, I'm I'm changing facial hair all the time. One thing, and I've spent some time here. I mentioned the wallpapers repository. This past week, I've spent a lot of time on DM scripts, which is my demon use scripts. And we have a ton of people that have uh, made uh, merge requests. Matter of fact, it looks like I've got one sitting here now. And this has happened since me starting the stream, I think. <laughs> so I've already got one merge request I need to go check out. But when I uh, did DM scripts, um, initially how this repo started is... What about three weeks ago? Let me actually go to my YouTube channel, go to the videos list here, and I made a video. It may even take me a second to find the video. Uh, wasn't the one about web bookmarks? It was. No, I thought it was right here in the last two or three weeks. Wait, I made a video about my D-menu scripts where I showed five or six example D-menu scripts. I, I think it's this one here. D-menu scripts solve real-life problems or solve problems with shell scripting and D-menu. That's been about a month ago. And I showed you six very quick and dirty D-menu scripts. A couple of them, I think, I, I really just threw together for that video. And then I pushed those six or seven scripts I started with to this repository and, of course, because that video has had 11,000, 12,000 people have watched it, a lot of people have come to help me out with uh, adding stuff to some of the scripts that I added, creating new scripts, and then I'm helping them with their scripts. And we've really got something kind of cool going on here. I've got uh, three or four people that regularly contribute to this repository. Like, they're pushing stuff every day or, you know, making edits and we have created a package build and I have the package build up on the Arch user repository so you can actually install DM scripts with uh, the package DM scripts dash get so if you yay dash capital S DM scripts dash get it should work <laughs> created a man page for it and we had somebody recently start on a make file for it so we can do a make install because not everybody uses Arch. Uh, you, you guys probably should if you're gonna, at least if you're gonna use the, my DM scripts. But we were trying to make something kind of universal for an installer. Initially, we had some kind of install script that we were trying to make work on every Linux distribution, but it was going to be a pain. Eventually, I was like, you know what? Let's just do the package build because everybody, I, I'm not everybody, but most of the people that watch me and probably are going to come to this repository and want these scripts are going to be Arch users. So as long as I get the Arch package working, everybody else can figure it out on their own. But you know what? The make file pretty much covers everybody else. Now, I have not tested out the um, the make file. It may work for you. It may not. This is something that's really kind of new. But definitely those of you on Arch, you can just install it from the AUR. You can just clone this repository. We had somebody come up with the idea of actually having uh, a config file for some of these scripts because there's a lot of customization options for some of these scripts. So if you want to in your .config directory, You'd have a DM scripts folder there where you could have some config options that would actually affect some of these scripts. Because these scripts, all of these live in user slash bin. That's where they get placed during the install. So they're actual binaries on the system, right? So if I go to my desktop, you know, like one of the scripts is dman, you know. I don't have to type the full path to the script somewhere since it's in slash user slash bin, you know, D man is actually the man pages. So if I wanted to search for a man page, like the D menu man page, there is the D menu man page. Uh, some of the other ones, you guys, D DM sounds was one I worked on yesterday for a video. <laughs> I told you guys, I came up with this one uh, rather quickly. Now I spent some time cleaning this one up, but choosing a sound file, for example, if I wanted, thunderstorm you know got some thunderstorms going on here you guys are actually not hearing that because I uh, pulse audio <laughs> it actually works fine on my desktop when I'm not recording but FF play is actually 
<laughs> it's actually playing it. Uh, let me stop it. Yeah, the output, instead of going to my speakers, is actually going to the uh, audio equipment behind me. But you guys know what rain clouds and thunderstorms sound like. So, But anyway, the DM Scripts repository has occupied a lot of my time this week. Hours and hours of my time. And like I said, we've got several people that are quite passionate about this little project. And we've got some pretty cool scripts. Now, I haven't actually tested out a lot of these. Some of these are new. Uh, this one here, uh, the USB mount script, I this was added in the last week. I haven't actually played with that one. DM Pac-Man uh, is a Pac-Man script as far as installing and removing software, I believe. I actually haven't tried this, but select operation. How about install? And <laughs> we get a list of everything in the repositories, I guess. That's interesting. I don't really have anything to install, but yeah, so... It's interesting the things that people come up with for scripts. Like, you know, everybody has different problems to solve. And that's what really made it interesting. Like, people have come up with scripts that I wouldn't have thought of. I'm sure some of the, the weird scripts I've come up with, people are like, oh, why does he need that? <laughs> but it's cool now. We've got 15, I think, scripts in that repository, and it's going to keep growing. It's interesting how a video I made a month ago where I threw together six rather crude scripts has actually turned into a pretty serious project I would say one of the other interesting things you know like there's so many aspects to this the package build and the make file we also have a pipeline here for uh running a check when somebody does a merge request it actually runs shell check on it to actually make sure that the uh, the bash code is actually legit. Not that, not that it's not legit. It's actually, you know, fix all the warnings. We're trying to have everything streamlined. We want everyone to have the, the correct shebang. That way we don't have 15 different shell shebangs in these scripts. and 15 different scripts. Uh Got a little bit of a style guide on there to, to guide people. Back to the chat here. ADT, what about your VTuber debut? I, mean, I, I don't actually know what a VTuber is. You guys would have to explain that one to me. Uh, let's see. Are you on Xmonad? Yeah, this is Xmonad today. Uh... I don't like the wallpaper though. I mean the wallpaper's alright. Let's pick a different wallpaper and we'll set it with X wallpaper. Uh, let's see, which one do I want? You know what? That's an oldie but goodie. I do like that one. So control X X sets that with X wallpaper. Yeah. I can I can get down with that. I like the monk staring at the arch logo. But yes, we're in X Monad today. Yeah, I wish I could hear it. I love the sound of thunder. Well, with Pavu control, I could have forced it to the right output, but it didn't seem like it mattered that much. But you know what? A little ambient noise probably would be good for the, the stream. So let me pull up Pavu control. What I'm going to do is run my DM sound script. Oh, that's not the, the right one. And let's choose sound file. And we will go to thunderstorm. And output, uh, output analog audio. Uh, I don't think I can change it. Hmm, that's unfortunate. That is weird because this worked the other day. <laughs> because it re did record my desktop audio the other day. So why is it not working today? Let me go into OBS. I hate to play in OBS while I'm streaming, but it wouldn't be the first time. Let's see. I'm going to change a setting and try it one more time. How about birds chirping? No. No birds chirping. 
Oh, well, I tried. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. <laughs> I don't know. It, it worked the other day. That's weird that it's not working now. It's, yeah, that's my problem with Pulse Audio. Yesterday, it was sending that to the correct output. Today, it's sending it to a different output. And I haven't done anything. I haven't even breathed on Pulse Audio, much less actually played with the configuration. So, let's see. Uh, Josh left a super chat. He says... Ever consider reviewing other people's window manager configs? And here's $5 in fund money, $480 to go. Okay, I don't know what the 480 is about, but I appreciate that. <laughs> other people's window manager configs. I, I don't know what I would say about it. I mean, somebody's window manager config is their preferences for stuff. So I have my preferences for stuff. They'll have different preferences for their stuff. But what am I going to say? I don't like their preferences? Well, it, it would just be weird. Let's see. Hey, DT, do you know about Mental Outlaw? It's more, it's more crazy about Gen 2 and DWM, but it's more... Sensible like you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that last sentence. Do I know Mental Outlaw? If you're asking, do I know about the channel? Yes, I don't. I haven't watched much of his content, but I've seen some of his stuff. If you're asking, do I know him personally? No, I haven't spoken to him personally. I'm not sure about your last sentence. It's more crazy about Gen 2 and DWM, but it's more sensible like you. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure where you were going with that. Um. Uh, Surprised he doesn't use nitrogen for the wallpaper. Well, in my Xmonad config, if you're late, uh, I have three different options for setting the wallpaper. So if I get back into my Xmonad and go to the uh, auto start hook here. This section here is setting the wallpaper. You see these five lines? I have four of them commented out. You pick the one you want in DT's OS. And if you want nitrogen, what you need to do is this last line, uncomment. And then the one setting it with X wallpaper, comment that out. <laughs> then recompile X monad, boom. It'll set the wallpaper using nitrogen. So, like I said, yeah, I'm gonna have options here. So I know not everybody wants to set their wallpaper using the SXIV image viewer and X wallpaper or with Faye, you know, nitrogen. Nitrogen's a great program. I love nitrogen. So I definitely want that available as an option too. But I don't want people to have to install nitrogen unless they actually are going to use it. So that's why I'm going to have some lines commented out. If you have nitrogen installed and want to use it, you can use it. If not, I'll probably have a X wallpaper, maybe Faye both as a dependency. Yeah, almost almost everybody's gonna have FEH installed anyway, because it's it's a dependency for so many other things. X wallpaper, maybe people have installed, maybe not, but it's not like that's a a very big dependency either. So, do you like frozen yogurt? I don't mind yogurt. Regular yogurt or frozen yogurt. <laughs> I don't eat it that often. Let's see. DT, got plans for a community live stream. Well, I do my monthly live streams with uh, the patrons of the channel. As far as uh, community live stream, I mean, like what? Like anybody just join me on camera? I can't do that. We got too many people that view this channel. I'd have hundreds of people <laughs> that like would want to join like a video call or something. It would be completely out of control. But if you are a member of my Patreon, we do a uh, a stream, a live stream, a two hour live stream on the last Sunday of every month. My chat with patrons. 
And those are always fun. We usually have a good time. I say we usually have a good time. We always have a good time. Uh, sometimes the conversations are about Linux and tech, and sometimes the conversations, they just go wherever. All right, guys. Well, I said I was going to stream for about an hour. We got about five minutes until we hit the hour mark. So if you guys in the chat, you got anything you want to ask, questions, comments, Linux related, dot file related, got any questions about my Xmonad, my Emacs, about uh, any of my packages that are hosted in the AUR for DM scripts or my shell color scripts or any of that. Now's the time to get an answer. Because I get questions all the time over on my GitLab. <laughs> like I get people opening issues. Uh, I do get a lot of people opening issues that I will say sometimes... I wonder why they open issues for the things that they open issues for. Uh, for example, obviously my configs work. And I say obviously because here's my Xmonad config. If it wasn't working properly, for one thing, Haskell is a compiled language, and uh, my Xmonad would actually not compile correctly if there was anything wrong with my config at all. I'm talking about a missed comma, bad spacing, <laughs> oh, Haskell's picky. So... My xmonad config works. So when you go and grab my xmonad config, and then you come and post on my GitLab, on my dot .files repo, and say, hey, I grabbed your uh, xmonad config. It doesn't work for me. No other information. You, know, you didn't tell me what distro you were on. You didn't tell me what version of xmonad is in your distros or repositories if it's not Arch, a rolling release distribution. You didn't tell me anything. You just said, hey, man, your config's broken. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not even going to respond. Like I, I don't have time to, because I'm not going to get into a long, drawn out, you know, thread where we respond about a half a dozen times about something that isn't even my fault. Like if my config definitely works, if it's not working for you, it's, it's not an issue with me or my config. So you probably should ask that question somewhere else. For example, that kind of question there, the, where would be the appropriate place to ask a question like that? Where I go grab somebody's config, and I know their config works for them, but it's not working for me? Well, I don't know. How about Xmonad has a subreddit, r slash Xmonad. Xmonad has a IRC channel. <laughs> like, ask the Xmonad guys why, you know... Post the config you're using, whether you grabbed it from somebody else or not. Say, hey, I, this is the config. It doesn't compile correctly, if that's the case. And here's the error message. And somebody that actually knows Xmonad will, will immediately tell you, oh, that error there, that's telling you to do this. And that's how you fix that. Uh, I'm surprised so many, you know, and I try to tell people, I, I, I don't say it on camera enough, is... Many times people don't post support questions where they should. I will give you the biggest example. Never, ever ask a support kind of question. You know, one that actually requires people copying and pasting code. Never post that question on YouTube. For one thing, YouTube doesn't format stuff right anyway if you're copying and pasting code. For, and another thing is... You know, typically you're going to ask a question, maybe somebody will answer, but even if they do, they're not going to come back, you know, the next day or a week later and see if you responded again. So you guys can have an actual ongoing like support thread kind of thing going on on YouTube. That's that's not that's not the proper platform for that. Matter of fact, I, I've gotten to the point I just ignore every kind of support related question on YouTube because it's just not even worth it's, it's just not even worth getting involved in that kind of stuff on YouTube. It's just not the right spot. Let's see. Hey DT, I've been thinking about buying a Moonlander for programming and gaming. Do you think it's worth the price or just overpriced, overhyped? No, I think it's absolutely worth the price. I would have bought it. I mean, I did buy it. But I mean, I didn't necessarily need my Moonlander because I had the Ergo Docs. 
I don't know if I, it was worth the the price since I already had the Ergo Docs because they're very very similar keyboards. But I don't mind having two because I can actually use two keyboards, I mean, different machines around the house, or if I wanted to take one because the Moonlander's light enough, it's got a carrying case. I could carry it to work if I had a, a, a job somewhere where I I wanted to carry my keyboard because the Moonlander is kind of different than a standard you know 110 key keyboard. So you know I can have the Ergo Docs at home. I could have my Moonlander at work with me, or I could carry it you know every day with me. But yes, it was absolutely worth the price to me. Maybe not to everybody else, but I don't know. Everybody that I've talked to, because I've done a few videos, of course, about the Ergo Docs. I did two or three videos about the Ergo Docs and then the video about the Moonlander when I bought it. And all you guys that have purchased a Ergo Docs or Moonlander, I don't, I haven't heard from anybody that says, man, I regret that purchase. <laughs> I haven't I haven't found any of those, but I've I've heard from plenty of people that said, "Man, I bought one of those Ergo Docs because you told me to to buy one, and man, it's the best keyboard ever. I'll never use another keyboard." I, I've got plenty of messages like that. DT, you haven't seen a thread on YouTube between two rocket enthusiasts. That thread had 125 messages just between those two. Yeah, but they probably weren't trying to copy and paste like snippets of code and error messages and things like that. ADT, i3WM, is it a bad choice? Uh, it's, it's not my favorite window manager, but if it's, it's not a bad choice, I, it's preference. What you, what you use is what you use. <laughs> uh, use what you want to use, what you like. You got to figure that out on your own. Oh yeah, DT's config is working for me. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was the Xmonad config or something else, but yeah. Uh, so that's why I spent a lot of time on these configs. <laughs> you know, I put a lot of effort in some of these configs, too. A lot of effort. Uh, especially with window managers, Xmonad, and Qtile, especially. I know a lot of you guys run my configs. Yeah, no, those two were talking about hardcore physics and rockets, says Big Bud. Uh, DT, have you looked at the VEB browser? No, somebody recommended it. Um, it may have been you, Kevin. I wrote it down on a to-do list. I haven't had time to take a look at it. It's a browser with Vim-like bindings. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it would be something... The browser with Vim-like key bindings. So, uh, Suckless Surf. Cube Browser, which obviously Cube Browser is a very nice product, or even things like uh, Brave or any of the Chromium-based browsers with some of the, the Vimium plugins, or Firefox or LibreWolf, any of the Firefox-based browsers with uh, the Vimium plugin or the uh, Tridactyl plugin. There's so many that do that. Like I, this VE, this VEB browser or whatever, I, I don't know. Like I, I don't have, I'm not very hopeful <laughs> that it's going to impress me. Because we literally have dozens of browsers that use VI bindings. Well, there, I can name probably six or eight that out of the box support VI bindings already. So it's it's not like it's... Like it's a new thing, right? They're kind of reinventing the wheel at this point. Let's see. ADT, hey, what webcam are you using these days? I don't have a webcam. I'm using a Panasonic Lumix G7 camera as a webcam, I guess. But it's a, it's a, you know, it's a mirrorless camera. It's a nice camera. Or it was when I bought it, what, three years ago. Still a nice camera, regardless, three years or not. Oh, uh, your Emacs config is working for me. So that was the config that uh, he had got working. Yeah. For those of you, I was going to mention how to get the uh, Doom Emacs config or the GNU Emacs config. Both of them were over on my GitLab. Uh, but the Doom Emacs config, all you need is my... Uh, config slash doom directory so in my dot config folder in my dot files look for a doom directory 
and grab all those files. Then install Doom Emacs and build it with my config. And it'll install all of my packages and everything. Alright guys, well I'm going to go ahead and get out of here for the evening. I do appreciate you guys hanging out with me. I know it was a bit of an impromptu stream. Didn't give you guys much of a heads up, but we had a nice little crowd here. And we got to chat a little bit about nerdy stuff. <laughs> All right. This is, I dig it. it. Says Ryan. Okay. And Joe Panico it says, evening DT and chat. Joe, we're wrapping things up, sir. You're late, Joe. We were just getting out of here, but you can always catch it on the replay, although I'm not sure if there's much that needs to be, uh, like if you missed this stream, we really didn't do much. I looked at some of my configs, some of my bash scripts and things like that, because we're trying to get DT's OS together. We're trying to get to the point where I have a cohesive desktop environment that I can put a deployment script out where people like I say hey if you're on an arch or arch based distribution just run this script and you get DT's Xmonad desktop with Doomy Max already installed with DT's dashboard with the Doomy Max logo I made that in GIMP by the way I'm actually really proud of that that took like three minutes for the logo <laughs> it's actually not not very nice but <laughs> Uh, I'm not much of an artist. But I do appreciate you stopping by, Joe. Hope everything's well, sir. Now let me get out of here. I'm going to go ahead and thank the patrons of the channel, too, before I go. Because these guys, they help support my work. Without these guys, I couldn't do what I do. Those of you that want to help me out, you guys know where to find me. I'm DistroTube over on Patreon. Alright, guys. Take care. Peace.